Hello everyone, I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History's Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. If you are interested in learning more about the military service of your family members, join us for a free workshop this Saturday, February 19th at 10 a.m. next door in the State Archives. Staff will teach participants how to use military records of Mississippi soldiers from the American Revolution to World War II. Space is limited, but you can register on the department's website or call our main number, 601-576-6850. On Thursday, February 24th at 11.30 a.m., Paige Mazell of Mazell's Camellia Hill Nursery will lead a free guided camellia walk through the Welty Garden, and heirloom varieties of camellias will be for sale. You can find more information about that event on the Eudora Welty House and Gardens Facebook page. And remember that that same evening, February 24th at 7 p.m., we'll have the premiere of the MDAH film, The Defenders, How Lawyers Protected the Movement here in this auditorium. You can watch the trailer on the department's YouTube channel. That should be a really fantastic event. And then I hope that we will see you next week for History's Lunch when Calvin Head and Leroy Johnson will tell the story of the Milestone Cooperative in Holmes County. Today, we are delighted to welcome David Taylor, Holly Foster, and Eric Platt, authors of the chapter Mississippi College and the Mississippi College Rifles, a campus at war and death on the battlefield in the new University Press of Mississippi book, Persistence Through Peril, Episodes of College Life and Academic Endurance in the Civil War South. David E. Taylor is an assistant professor of psychology at North Shore Technical Community College. He earned his PhD in higher education administration from the University of Southern Mississippi and studied at the Oxford Baptist Institute. Holly A. Foster is an assistant professor of higher education in the School of Education at the University of Southern Mississippi. She earned her BA and MA in English from George Mason University an MA in History from Arizona State University, and an MED in Student Affairs in Higher Education and PhD in Higher Education from the University of Virginia. R. Eric Platt is an Associate Professor of Higher and Adult Education at the University of Memphis. He earned his BS in Psychology and MED from the University of Southern Mississippi, and his PhD in Educational Leadership and Research and Higher Education Administration from Louisiana State University. Platt is the author of Sacrifice and Survival, Identity, Mission, and Jesuit Higher Education in the American South, and Educating the Sons of Sugar, Jefferson College, and the Creole Planter Class of South Louisiana. We'll hear first from Eric Platt, and then Holly Foster, David Taylor will close it out. Help me welcome Eric. Good morning. Uh, well, not morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for letting us come here. Um, I'm going to speak for a little bit off the written page. Then my colleague Holly will join us. And then David is going to finish us out with uh, a biography of one of the Mississippi College students that featured so prominently uh, in the Deep South Civil War. So, um, in 1861, a professor at former Louisiana College in East Feliciana Parish wrote, Students have all gone to war. College suspended, and God help the right. Statements like this have marked various narratives that chronicle the closure of Southern higher education at the onset of or during the American Civil War. Though most Southern institutions of higher education um, did close, there were a handful that remained open, weathering the storm and providing instruction to remaining students. In Mississippi, the only one to do so was the still extant Baptist-affiliated Mississippi College. Across the South, other institutions such as Wesleyan Female College in Georgia and Wofford College in South Carolina also remained open. Despite these examples of ward time enduring colleges, the history of Civil War era Southern higher education is often described as devastated and barren. However, not all colleges experienced physical destruction. Institutions such as Wake Forest University in North Carolina and Tulane University of Louisiana closed but did not experience substantial campus damage. On the other hand, academies such as the Georgia Military Institute, Alabama's LaGrange Military College, let's see, 
Oh, there we go. Sorry, guys. Technology. Um, let's see, where was I? And Alabama's LaGrange Military College and the Mississippi-based Corona Female College were raided or commandeered and burned by federal soldiers, never to reopen as independent institutions. Those that remained in existence for the entirety or majority of the war did so for various reasons. While some relied on preparatory departments that enrolled students too young to enlist, other academies garnered the support of local communities for material and human resources. Some profited from parental perceptions that enrolling children as boarding students would keep their progeny safe from conscription. Other regional colleges benefited from geographic locales removed from raiding troops and destructive cannon fire. Still, professors and students at institutions such as the University of Virginia and Spring Hill College in Alabama played host to Union soldiers in order to stave off campus destruction. This was not, however, a ubiquitous truth. Many academic buildings were burned, facilities were ransacked, and academic buildings were converted into barracks, stables, or makeshift hospitals. For example, Jefferson College in Convent, Louisiana closed at the beginning of the war not long after federal troops invaded the surrounding area by means of the Mississippi River and, amongst various other sites, chose the college campus to serve as an army barracks due to its proximity to the all-important waterway. While stationed at the college turned barracks, Union officer F.G. Barnes lamented his own lack of personal higher education. Perusing the college's laboratory and scattering of books, he purloined several volumes. Writing to his wife, Barnes stated, Everyone here is secesh, and I feel like spoiling them every chance I get. Like the campus barracks conversion of Jefferson College, many institutions were repurposed for a variety of wartime uses. Buildings at the University of Georgia were repurposed as an army hospital, quartermaster storage, and refuge for war-torn families. Two dormitories at Howard College campus in Birmingham, Alabama, were repurposed as a Confederate hospital. Maryville College in Tennessee served both armies, Union and Confederate, as barracks and then as horse stables. Apart from the large-scale Civil War College of so many Southern institutions, those that remained open included early Huntington College near Montgomery and Georgia's Mercer University, which continued to operate with low student numbers, scant resources, and faculty ranks stripped bare either by forced conscription or voluntary enlistment. Those faculty who remained subsisted on substantially reduced wages and, like their pupils, were cut off from family and friends. On those campuses that managed to remain open, faculty wrote about the decreased food and clothing supplies, in addition to progressively dwindling enrollment. While remaining professors concerned themselves with their institution's survival, some male students, bored with academic activities, longed for the perceived honor of battle and were eager to join the fray. There were even attempts to run away, join the army, and dodge the drudgeries of academic study. At other college, students helped with nursing duties as portions of their institutions were transformed into infirmaries. Unlike those academies that closed and were repurposed as hospitals, the University of Virginia in Charlottesville hosted an army hospital while offering classes to male students who opted not to enlist. Later in the war, some wounded men partook in classes and pursued their own higher education. At academies with substantial military curricula, such as the Virginia Military Institute and South Carolina's uh, Military Academy, otherwise known as the Citadel, cadet training, once meant to instill rigidity and a sense of gentlemanliness, became founts for Confederate officer training. Many such college cadets went into service not long after the war commenced or remained at their institutions to train incoming recruits. VMI cadet officers oversaw the training of enlistment, uh, enlisted men who, although older, knew little of military life. In the face of wartime hardships, college students, whether male or female, found ways to support the Confederacy and its enlisted personnel. At Wesleyan College, the female students formed their own makeshift cadet corps and equipped themselves with wooden rifles. They practiced regular drill and marched to the local community to display their Southern patriotism. Meanwhile, students at Spring Hill College penned verses championing the secessionist cause and proclaimed, rise, Southerners, rise, tis the voice of war. Certainly such student activities inflamed Confederate patriotism within their campus communities and local surroundings. While some students wrote stories for college periodicals and heaped glories on Confederate figures like Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee, others honed their rank-and-file military drill in hopes of bolstering Southern battalions should they enlist. Much of what has been discussed so far appears in the Civil War saga of Mississippi College. 
Students not only longed for military engagement, they overwhelmingly supported the Confederacy in both word and deed. As the threat of war intensified, Mississippi College students, like their Southern collegiate peers, crafted a military company engaged in active service, a far cry from the benign desire to create and maintain a religiously affiliated college for the burgeoning state of Mississippi. When Mississippi College was chartered in 1826, the concern to root higher education in religion was paramount. However, in time, religion was often set aside to prioritize cadet training and Confederate support. Centrally located in Mississippi, Hampstead Academy, the precursor to Mississippi College, was established along the major man-made thoroughfare of entering inland, the Natchez Trace. Uh, the institution was neither located near the Mississippi River nor along the seacoast where institutions such as Jefferson Military College and St. Stanislaus College had been founded. But here at, the remote spring, at a remote spring far removed from major waterway, waterways, early central Mississippi residents took it upon themselves to found first a college and then a surrounding community. In 1827, Hampstead Academy was renamed Mississippi Academy and later Mississippi College by an act of the legislature on December 16, 1830. Social and academic life reflected period norms of liberal arts curricula, religious observation, and adherence to a strict code of conduct. Students were given friendly warnings by faculty members for minor rule infractions. More serious rule breaking resulted in public chastisement, suspension, or even academic expulsion. These punishments were described as just and proper in college catalogs and were further supported by the institution's laws for the government of students. In addition to penalties, class structures and academic expectations were also harsh. From the beginning of the fall term through March, students were expected to study from morning prayers until 12.30 p.m. After a brief, a brief lunch and short break period, students recommenced their studies for, uh, from 2 o'clock until 4 in the afternoon and again from 7 until 9 each evening. If students were not engaged in recitations or classes, they were expected to be in their room studying. Even the weekends lacked freedom. Per academic catalog, uh, catalogs, quote, on Friday night, students must prepare for Monday. Religious education was also important at the young college. Sabbath school, an early form of the modern Sunday school, um, daily uh, scripture reading and campus Bible society participation was mandatory. Upon arriving at the institution, students were expected to sign a matriculation pledge, swearing to keep the rules or suffer the consequences. Given the college's rigorous behavioral guidelines and intense hours of study, it might appear that this Baptist college was a place of totalitarianism with little room for enjoyment. This was not entirely the case, but forms of social enjoyment fostered by the college were rooted in period religious practices and ideals of gentlemanly conduct. As the antebellum era came to a close, faculty and administrators alike acknowledged the national political upheaval surrounding the presidential election of Abraham Lincoln and the realities of disunion. This concern was mentioned in the college's 1861 catalog, but was couched in the express belief that the war would be short-lived. While the war raged and older students enlisted, Mississippi College relied more heavily on its well-stocked preparatory department. Uh, still, the institution's administration maintained admittances and paired new students with local families for lodging and meals. Faculty believed this housing arrangement provided students with, quote, the advantages of family influence while away from home. The practice of pairing students with host families coupled with a strict code of conduct left little room for students to err, even though temptations abounded. Antebellum Clinton had grown to become a hotbed of promiscuity, especially at local resorts and hotels. Amusements in the forms of dance bands, billiard tables, tin pin alleys, and choice liquors and wines were available for those with money. In response, and in accordance with denominational practices, the college's rule book expressly forbade the playing of billiards, cards, raffling, or gambling in general. But as the war permeated Mississippi, student life changed drastically. As reports of successful, uh, successful battles trumpeted in local newspapers, Faculty urged students to take their studies more seriously, leave worldly desires outside the realms of academia, and become the young men God intended them to be. By placing their students under the authority of a local household, as well as the college's faculty, the administration expressed its belief that their wards would not fall by the wayside, but would become the educated Christian leaders Mississippi would need in the future, particularly when the war ended. 
After the Union shelling of Fort Sumter, Mississippi College students began to enlist. To support the institution's wartime existence, faculty wages were further diminished, and the need to maintain a strong preparatory department was overemphasized. Per the college's catalog, quote, though a large number of other colleges have suspended, we have deemed it best to continue the exercise of our college. Our country does not require the service of all of her young men in the field, and many boys are too young to enter the army. All these should continue their studies and thus fit themselves better for the weighty responsibilities will, that will be theirs in a few years. I turn it over now to my colleague, Holly Foster. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to read a little bit from the text about Mississippi College during the war. Mississippi College, like several of its regional academic counterparts, responded to the call for trained Confederate soldiers. At the start of the war, 32 students and three faculty formed their own volunteer regiment titled the Mississippi College Rifles. In time, this college affiliate corps was reorganized as the 18th Mississippi Regiment. The rifles were formed in February of 1861 for the purpose of preparing young men for military service. Johnson Wellborn, a 36-year-old Clinton mer merchant and Mississippi College trustee, was elected as the company's commander. While some students' families paid for their sons' uniforms and arms, Wellborn was reported to have paid the cost of any student unable to finance himself in the military company. Spirit soared in the initial days of the Confederacy, and Mississippi College students supported secession and the chance to fight. However, as the harsh realities of military life sullied the concept of battlefield honor, student zeal decreased. Drilling is warm work, wrote a private in the Mississippi College Rifles. We would get pretty tired before our day's work ended. We were, however, learning our lessons in soldiering, and the drill was an important part of them. It is this mainly that makes the difference between trained soldiers and a mob. Confederate military patriotism continued thr throughout the early years of the war. On April 18, 1861, Silas Talbert White, a senior in the college's preparatory department and member of the Mississippi College Rifles, wrote to his family, Dear Father, I seat myself tonight to give you as long patriotic letter as I can. I feel a spirit of resistance to Northern oppression, and I tend to stand to Southern rights as long as I have a drop of blood and a single bullet to shoot. There is a general determination to stand to Southern rights or die in the attempt. We, the students of Mississippi College, have formed a military company and are going to offer our service to the governor as soon as possible. During the initial months of the war, student cadets enjoyed the gaiety and excitement that permeated pro-Confederate Clinton, Mississippi. Mrs. Ulysses Moffitt, a Clinton resident, hosted a social gathering for the college's military company before they departed for the war front. Not long thereafter, one cadet described the following. During the month of May, the company basked in the sweet smiles of lovely women and indulged itself with the luxuries abundantly showered upon it by the good people of Clinton and Hines. Area female denizens stitched together a company flag that was presented to the cadets. In response, Judson Thigpen, a professor at Mississippi College and elected lieutenant of the College Rifles, responded with gratitude, saying, Ladies of Clinton and vicinity, with high beating hearts and breasts full of emotion, we receive from your hands this handsome flag, proud emblem of our young republic. We prize this flag, ladies, not so much for its intrinsic worth, but for the sake of those who gave it. On May 27, 1861, the College Rifles departed campus while the institution's brass band played tunes such as Dixie, Bonnie Blue Flag, and The Girl I Left Behind. Leaving the college, the cadets boarded a train headed for Corinth. 
Members of the Rifles joined the Confederate Army first as Company E of the 18th Mississippi Infantry. The 18th Infantry was thereafter transferred to Camp Pickens near Manassas Junction in Virginia to serve under Confederate General P.T. Beauregard. The college cadets experienced their first episode of conflict at the First Battle of Manassas on July 21, 1861. By war's end, only eight cadets were present at the Confederate surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. Of the 139 students who joined the college rifles, 15 were killed in battle or succumbed to war-related wounds, nine died of disease, three resigned, 11 transferred to other military units, 14 deserted, 52 were discharged for various reasons, two were dropped from the rolls, and 33 were unaccounted for. After Appomattox, the cadet flag was smuggled away in the britches of 2nd Lieutenant Joseph Buckles. While the cadets were away at war, Mississippi College fought to remain open. In addition to the loss of student cadets, three instructors left to join the Southern armies. In time, several other students also exited to enlist. Even so, eight students graduated in the summer of 1861. The next year, only two graduated. By the end of 1862, most of the faculty had resigned due to reductions in pay. The burden to maintain the academy fell to President Isaac Newton Erner. Under Erner's wartime administration, the college's preparatory department averaged 30 students. However, during the final years of conflict, the college outlook was bleak. General Ulysses S. Grant invaded Jackson, Mississippi and the surrounding communities. Alice Shirley, a student at nearby Central Female Institute, recounted the infiltration. She said the terrified people cried out, the Yankees are coming, the Yankees are coming. The usually quiet town of Clinton was now all confusion. The soldiers were bent on destruction, stables were torn down, smoke houses invaded and emptied of their bacon and hams. Chicken houses were depopulated, vehicles of all kinds taken or destroyed, barrels of sugar and molasses were emptied, the dry goods stores were broken into. At last, the soldiers were gone, and Clinton was left to take a long breath, pick up the remains of everything, and go on with life again. It was reported that President Erner urged forces to leave the campus and its facilities unharmed. Union officers complied, but allowed their men to occupy the campus grounds. In July of 1864, Captain A. W. A. Montgomery, accompanied by 100 troops, attempted to capture federal soldiers at the campus. Despite Montgomery's efforts, Union soldiers retreated into the college chapel and repulsed the attack. Still, the college remained open under the leadership of President Erner. When the war ended in 1865, Erner requested back pay from Mississippi College's governing board. During the war, the president's salary was reduced by 25% to further support the weekend academy. In total, the governing board owed Erner $6,681.55, or about $122,500 today. The administrative board, however, was unable to pay. As a result, Erner sued, settled for $6,000, vacated the presidency, and then relocated to South Carolina. Without Erner and with several unpaid debts, Mississippi College was in dire straits. Most of the college's pre-war endowments had existed almost entirely on paper. In the wave of Confederate inflation, the college's funds were stripped bare, Local resident and Mississippi College devotee, Mrs. Adelia Hillman, made a fundraising trip to New England and raised enough money to provide Mississippi College with a $7,000 loan in the name of her husband, Walter Hillman, who was president of Central Female Institute. Again, the trustees struggled to pay their debts. Hillman almost took possession of the college, but the college's mathematics instructor, M.T. Martin, raised the necessary funds to repay Hillman. 
Though debts had been paid, the college was left without a president. Though Erner had kept the college open during the war, the institution needed a new leader to oversee campus rebuilding, lead enrollment efforts, and enhance the academy's curricular structure. Hillman, the successful president of Central Female Institute, was asked to replace Erner. In the fall of 1867, two students enrolled in the college's freshman class. These new pupils joined nine preparatory students. Owing to Hillman's reputation as a sound educator and academic leader, Mississippi College's enrollment swelled. Thereafter, positive reports began to circulate in regional newspapers, and enrollment jumped to 153 in 1870. By 1873, enrollment reached 190. Under the new presidential administration of Warren Sheldon Webb, support from Mississippi Baptists intensified. As a result, relationships between the college and denomination intensified and remained strong through the latter half of the 19th century. By the end of Southern Reconstruction, state newspapers announced that at Mississippi College, young men may acquire as complete and thorough an education here as any college in the South. Not only had enrollment grown, the college maintained a bevy of stable academic departments that mirrored popular antebellum liberal arts academies. At the same time, the curricular structure was modified to include practical job-specific courses such as commercial science and commercial law. As the institution progressed into the 20th century, enrollment rose to 400, and the organization's endowment climbed to 500,000, thanks in part to regional Baptists as well as college alumni. Today, Mississippi College remains in existence as the longest lasting institution of higher education in the state of Mississippi, the second oldest Baptist college in the nation, and one of the few Southern colleges that remained open during the Civil War. The wartime history of Mississippi College is indeed one of persistence through peril. Though the academy remained open and survived the tumultuous years of reconstruction, it should be remembered that several of its students served in the military, died, and were buried far from home. Such was the case with student cadet Silas Talbert White. Indeed, the Civil War story of Mississippi College is not complete without a recounting of this well-documented student turned Confederate enlistee, which David will present. Good afternoon. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge Carrie Fox Clark, who is the world's renowned expert on the Mississippi College rifle. So when you stand before people uh, to address it, uh, it's, it's some, I hope I don't make a mistake. To, in, to understand the life of Silas Talbert White, it would be important to go back and realize where he came from. His grandfather, John White, was born in 1780 in the Darlington District of South Carolina. In 1806, he married uh, Lydia Morgan Timmons, who was the widow of, women, of William Timmons, and she had been raised in the household of a Baptist preacher. After marriage, Lydia and John White migrated to East Feliciana Parish in Louisiana, leaving behind her two sons that were from the previous marriage. One of these sons would later go on to become a Baptist preacher, and he would also be one of the signers of the Ordinance of Secession in South Carolina on December 20th of 1860. These two facts shows that Silas's family in South Carolina had both Baptist roots and strong Southern sentiment. They moved to East, Felici East Feliciana Parish by way of the Tennessee River Valley. They went overland to the Tennessee River, floated down the river to uh, the Mississippi, and then down to Natchez, walking eastward across 
uh, the land until they found their site there in East Feliciana Parish. Uh, the life there in East Feliciana was m- very much uh, a pioneer life. They did not have the, necess- the, the basic necessities that they had experienced back in South Carolina. But from that point, John White built his life with his new family. Two of them were born immediately, uh, two sons, Eli White and uh, Andrew Jackson White, who became Sal- uh, Silas Talbert White's father. Uh, he was raised there in the community. He probably went to his elementary education at the Hepzibah Baptist Church. The Hepzibah Baptist Church, we know, was the church that they attended, and it probably doubled as a rudimentary uh, education site for those who were there in that area. In the fall of 1860, we find that Silas Talbert White was in attendance at Mississippi College as a senior in the preparatory department. Silas witnessed through the influence of the college and somewhat connected town of Clinton the election of 1860 and saw Abraham Lincoln elected president and the division that this brought to the country. In the spring of that year, the college catalog was printed which read, As soon as the present war ends and within the last month, the madness of the Washington government having forced actual war upon us Many of our students and three of our teachers formed themselves into a volunteer company called the the Mississippi College Rifles. On April 18th of that year, 1861, S.T. White wrote home to his parents, Father, mother, brothers, and all, it is with tears in my eyes that I think of leaving you to go to the battlefield, and I now ask your assent." to the great and glorious cause which we have undertaken. Please write immediately, I shall not leave before I get an answer, and if I don't go with this company, I'm going to come home and go with someone else. Now there are two things that are very much reflected even in student life in colleges today about Silas's letter. First of all, he asked permission and then didn't wait to get it. And second of all, in the closing lines of his letter, he said, and send some money. (laughs) Of the interval that ensued after his writing the letter, and again I'm quoting from Kerry Fox Clark, who's with us today, the town of Clinton prepared to send their boys off gallantly. According to Robert Parrish, the son of former Mississippi College President Consider Parrish, Parish and a student at the school during the fl- flowery month of May, the company basked in the sweet smiles of lovely women and indulged itself with the luxuries abundantly showered upon it by the good people of Clinton and Hines. Several ladies, and I will spare you the reading of all of their names, uh, made a flag, and the flag was made of three bars of red, white, and red silk with a white canton bearing eight six-pointed stars, which you've seen before already in the slides. As has already been noted, resplendent in their uniforms of butternut gray and carrying the colorful company flag, 98 men of the Mississippi College Rifles boarded a train at the Clinton Depot on May 27th for the two-hour journey to Corinth for training. A large crowd of more than 500 people joined in the excitement, giving the company an enthusiastic send-off. The college band played patriotic music, and the crowd sang the Bunny Blue Flag and Dixie. The young men radiated confidence and believed the war would be over in a few months. Sometime during their stay at Corinth, Silas's parents caught up with him, and he was reassigned to the 4th Louisiana Infantry on July the 9th of that year. This was not an uncommon practice. Parents often wanted their children to be under the protection of someone they knew. He was first assigned to the Mississippi Gulf Coast, then to Ship Island, and he, according to his letters, wrote back home and said that was like living in Hades with all the heat and sand and not a drop of water to drink. 
then to the Athachalaya River Basin to create obstacles for Union gunboats. There between, uh, uh, excuse me, he loved this time on the river, noted that there were several sugar plantations and that there were refining uh, systems built up there for the refining of sugar. But he kept writing back to his parents, longing to be in the real fight of things. Many of his comrades there at college, you will remember, were on the East Coast under Robert E. Lee. After Confederate losses on the Cumberland and Tennessee River, he got his chance. The Louisiana Fourth was shipped to Corinth, Mississippi, as the Union boats pushed up the Tennessee River. And there between Corinth and Pittsburgh landing on the Tennessee, it all came to a head at a small Methodist church called Shiloh. On March 23rd of 1861, he, he wrote, We expect to have a bully fight in a few days, one that will settle the fate of Tennessee, the state whose character is blotted forever and the headquarters, and one in which the Yankees will be, according to my notion, cut entirely to pieces. We are fortifying ourselves at this point and have an army of 70 or 80,000. Our pickets can plainly hear the drum of the Yankees who are about 15 miles from this point. It is said that the Yankees have their baggage mark Corinth or Hale, and according to my opinion, they will see the latter place long before they see Corinth. In his initial letter of, 18, uh, of April 18th of 1861, he had written, Father, to die for one's country is sweet. Die, die. It may be on the scaffold, but if it is the will of God that my country shall require the poor offering of my soul, I am ready to give it when the hour comes. On April the 6th, the morning dawned after a heavy rain that had drenched the Confederate forces the night before. They moved out across the battlefield toward an area that was called the Hornet's Nest, the Louisiana Fourth. Silas White's prophetic vision of dying for his country came to fruition when a cannonball exploded, taking his life. Reading from another account of that day, the morning of the 6th, we were aroused very early, but had not been up long when the report of musketry told us that the enemy's pickets were being driven in and that the battle was about to begin. We were immediately formed in line under the command of Colonel Gibson. The Washington artillery on the left, our regiment, the 4th Louisiana Infantry next, which was where Silas White was at. Then the 13th Louisiana and the 1st Arkansas. We advanced about a half a mile when a federal battery opened, on, opened fire on us. And we, for the first time, heard the shrill whistle of a shell, which soon became familiar. The Washington artillery was immediately gotten in position and replied promptly, and with good effect. When we filed across an open field, and although within almost 300 yards of the battery, which continued to shell us all the time, yet the ranks were not once broken, but the most perfect order prevailed. Of the 575 men that Gibson led into battle that day, 209 were lost. This was the case for many young men both from the South and the North who went off to war thinking glorious lines of dulce et decorum est, thinking that they were going off to die for their country and that that would be glorious only to be buried in a mass grave. I have been to both Shiloh trying to find, trying to pinpoint, could not find, the exact location, mass graves are that way. But I have been to the Jackson White Cemetery in East Feliciana Parish and noted there a stone that was erected by his family. Silas Talbert White remembered here 
as a young man, 18 years of age, going, dying for what he believed to be the right call at that time. We thank you for, your, for this opportunity of being here with you. At this time, we are going to open the floor for questions. Thank you. If anyone has a question, you can raise your hand and we'll put it to them. All right. Before you take that down, I was, my question was, who are those four people on the front of the book? Those are actually four cadets uh, from the Citadel. Uh, they were uh, part of a company that shot uh, on the Star of the West uh, ship. You know, many people think Fort Sumter is where the war began. Well, at the Citadel, they love to say, well, actually, we started the war. Let me ask a question. I'm going to read a comment first uh, from the live stream. Tony Morgan says, Alice Shirley, only daughter of James and Adeline Shirley, was attending the Central Female Institute uh, on present-day MC campus during the Siege of Vicksburg, as you would noted. Her home was the Shirley House, located inside the Vicksburg National Military Park at Tour Stop Number 2. Oh, that's amazing. I was actually at uh, that park the other day with some friends, yeah. and we actually got to go, not through it, but got to go in and peer through the windows. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Yeah. And then a question from Alan Wright. Do I remember correctly that Provine Chapel served as a Civil War hospital, and underneath were stables for their horses? That's correct. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Questions from the audience? In accounts of the Civil War in the South, there is often a lamentation for dying for one's country and fighting for one's country. The South has been persistent in not accepting the Constitution. The country was the United States of America. And we see that today. We can't agree on the fact that they are the United States of America. To what do you attribute that? That is a very complex question yeah. and a very good one. I've got time. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely fine. You're correct. You know, the Confederacy was a treasonous government. Government. It was not supposed to exist as something separate. Uh, we know that the South felt a lot of abolitionist pressure. They felt like a lot of their way of life was being removed. And so a lot of this idea of being the slave-holding South, this, this the ability to hold on to the legacy of the South, got wrapped up in the politics. Um, the idea of letting go of a support structure. I mean, the South really hasn't recovered from the Civil War. We made all of our money on the backs of enslaved people. When that was removed, our economy was destroyed, right? And so there's still this harken back, that lost cause ideology. The South will rise again. One day we'll become this all-important financial place again. But really, when you look back at it, ethically, morally, it was an incorrect system to begin with. And I think so much of that is still tied up in the idea that we were once this very profitable region. We just don't always want to look at the real reasons why we were profitable. I think we can all agree that it's a good thing that the Union was preserved and that Mississippi was not sectioned off in a Confederate States, but that the United States did remain together. And because of that, even the South has prospered more than they would have having been sectioned off. I was just curious what all your connections to Mississippi College is. Are, are you graduates of the school or just an interest for this book? No, when we started the book project, um, we started going through different institutions and my colleague and I had read a lot on Civil War higher ed history and it was all, well, this is, everything shut down, everything shut down. Well, I had spent years working with the Jesuits at Loyola, College, uh, Loyola University New Orleans and at Spring Hill College, and I knew that wasn't the case. That was an odd thing. There were accounts, and so we started doing work and finding different institutions, and so we started soliciting and saying, hey, let's write a book. And we had different authors say, well, you know what, Duke University, former Trinity College, it didn't close, or Wolford College uh, didn't close, and somebody called and said, hey, North Carolina didn't close. 
And then Alabama called and said, we didn't close. And we're like, actually, you did. And, and, and you got burned down pretty bad. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a graduate of LSU. Go Tigers. Um, <laughs> and I did my graduate work at the University of Virginia, which was sort of a hub of activity during the war. Um, and so we were able to sort of make that connection early on. And then it just developed. And everyone came in with their own interests. And, and I was their student. <laughs> I'm the old man on stage, but they are both my mentors. And one of the things, I was, I was going through my PhD program there, and I was struggling with all of this multivariate analysis and all of that stuff. And Dr. Platt, who is an expert in his field, turned me on to doing historical research. And Mississippi College was close at hand. I went and visited the archives there and was, was met warmly on campus, uh, very helpful, the people at Mississippi College. I was just wondering whether you knew where the Mississippi College rifles flag is now. I know you mentioned that one of the soldiers tucked it in his back pocket after Appomattox. Can, can I take that one? Yes, okay. you Go can. Right. <laughs> I looked for that thing and looked for that thing. I mean, literally, as a researcher, this was one of the things that was sort of like a eureka moment uh, when we were able to find something. You would search and search for days, not be able to find anything. And I never found it until we started getting ready for this presentation. It's here. <laughs> it's here. I'm going to read this question as I'm walking to take the other one. Uh, it's a question, David, for you about uh, the materials you used in the research for your, uh, could you say a little bit more about the particular materials you used in researching your part of this? Sure. My research was done primarily in the archives of Mississippi College. Uh, also, LSU has some things, and Southeastern Louisiana University in Hammond. Uh, that's where we found the photo of Silas mm -hmm. Talbert White there. Uh, I used their archives, I used periodical papers that are still uh, archived in places. I did online searches, there are places that you can, and I, I was amazed to be able to go back and find facsimiles of the muster role of him being mustered into uh, the Mississippi, uh, excuse me, the Louisiana 4th on July the 9th and then his death certificate or his death record. And, when you find these things, it's sort of a eureka moment because you're amazed that after all the work you put into it, you're able to find something that's 150 years old. Oh no, it's Carrie. <laughs> it, it, it's not a question. The, the muster roll for the Mississippi College Rifles is here in the archives. Um, and the flag, I wish you had have told me you were looking for it. I've known where it was. Ever since I was born, it was given to the archives by my family after, and long yeah. after the death of William Lewis. Um, and just in a side note, because of the interest in the Shirley House, uh, you may not know the only reason it is still standing is because James Shirley was a northerner and he supported the North and he lived in the house the whole time the battles were raging around him. You see the pictures of the house on the top of the cliff with the caves underneath it quite often. And think about the fact that the family was living there. He were, walked to Clinton at the age of 70 plus to collect his daughter uh, when Clinton and Vicksburg were in the midst of all of this. And that was the summer of 63. And uh, got rides back three-fourths of the way to Vicksburg with the Union troops so that he didn't have to walk back. And, and again, Just Car inside. Carrie Fox Clark, the expert on <laughs> the Mississippi College Rifles. You mentioned Fort Sumner, and I'm wondering what happened in there. What did, Was the fight underneath or outside? Uh, the, the shelling of Fort Sumter? Yeah. yeah, so that happened as pretty much everything occurs. None of these college students from this institution were at that 
uh, particular battle. But news from that infiltrated the South. I mean, the Times-Picayune in New Orleans had huge cover pages, you know, Sumter has fallen, and then you see after that Mississippi newspapers, Alabama newspapers, Georgia, they start running it. What's interesting is when you go into these college records, students were really into newspapers. You don't think about that today. You know, I, I'm lucky if college students are wanting to read the news. Um, but, I mean, the newspapers for them was a big source. And during the war, they would only get like one or two, and so they pass it around. Um, but this became huge for them. Um, one of the things I was talking about at Spring Hill College, they would write poetry. And you can tell they took direct references from the newspapers and wove it into there. So even though they weren't a part of some of these landmark moments, they were still very aware of them and were very, very attuned to when they won and when they lost. I have a question actually about, uh, it, I really enjoyed the chapter. I haven't finished the, the rest of the book, but I'm looking forward to it. But uh, the story of one of the ways that Mississippi College kept its doors open was by not paying all of its folks. Would y'all tell that story a little bit? So that was sadly a very usual occurrence. Yeah. Um, you know, we have any educators in the house? <laughs> you can stay anonymous if you want. Um, you know, I've had students ask me, you know, why is there this idea that, you know, educators should be paid so little and they should give back to their vocation? And I remind them when I teach my social foundation course, that's not new. I said, you know, one of the big pressures for many instructors during the Civil War was that, well, you know your calling for education is more important than the money. <laughs> Get back to you on that one later. Um, so a lot of people felt like they kind of had to stick with it. I mean, over time, two or three years of receiving no money or a fraction of what you were making, a lot of people left over this. Um, the ones who stayed, you could tell there was a real big investiture on their part to see these places stay open. They didn't want the institution to close on their watch. Uh, like the president of modern-day University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Uh, he was so worried about Confederate soldiers, uh, Confederate and Union soldiers coming onto campus that he said, you know what, I'm out. And when he left in 1862, I believe, back for South Carolina, the institution closed. So having these figures there, even though they weren't being paid much and they didn't have a lot of the resources they normally had, was important, uh, particularly the idea of fostering that preparatory department. You know, we think now of the idea of having a 12-year-old, a 13-year-old on campus, that's, oh, that's not possible. Well, the separation of preparatory departments from colleges didn't happen really into the end of the 19th century, not consistently across the United States. And so colleges often home grew their own students with their own preparatory department. So all of a sudden, the war happens, an enlistment age comes forward, conscription officers come and take the rest of your students, the attention turns heavily to that younger group and maintaining that group because that's how you're going to keep it alive. Any other questions? We have copies of the book for sale over here. I'm sure our panelists today will be happy to autograph those. Thank you all for being with us. Don't forget the programs that we have coming up, uh, the genealogy program this weekend, the history's lunch next weekend. But uh, help me thank right now our panelists for this program today. Thank you.